adventure begins on a dark and stormy night in this roadside tavern. What's that you say? You don't have a roadside tavern? No problem. How to make this tavern today on Dungeon Craft. Welcome to Dungeon Craft, I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and one of my viewers, Lefty Holmes, asks, Hey Professor, when are you going to give us a tutorial on making a building? Good question, Lefty, because I have that intro where all the, that swooping through all those buildings that look like this. I actually made those buildings from scratch, and the reason, Lefty, I've been putting it off is because making a building is a living nightmare. The two things that make buildings difficult are windows and roof tiles. Roof tiles are a nightmare. Most of the time they're made out of cardboard and you got to cut them out of cardboard and then you got to paint them and then you got to dry brush them and it's a big process and that's why people, all crafters, hate them. Jeremy at Black Magic Craft has some cool ideas that involve making the shingles out of styrofoam and, and cutting the shingles individually with a proxon cutter. It's a really cool idea, but I don't have a cutter like that. So I had to figure out another innovative way to do it. I tried to set myself a challenge for this video and do it all in one day, and Lefty, I am proud to say I succeeded, although I am completely exhausted. However, you're going to be the beneficiary because I'm going to show you how to make this building from scratch for less than $6 right now. On the right, I have a professionally produced resin house. It's very high quality. It looks terrific. But it's kind of impractical. If you take off the roof and you put miniature figures in here, which I have, it's difficult to get in and manipulate them, and it's, it's hard to see inside and forget about putting furniture in there. Contrast that to my scratch-built house. You just lift off the roof, and you can see inside. This is the inside of the tavern. It's a 6 inch by 6 inch double-sided dungeon tile that I showed you how to make in my dungeon tile video. Having the roof removed like this makes a lot more sense to me. So I'm going to show you how to make this building. This is the building I'm going to be basing it off of. It's the one that's in my intro to the Dungeon Craft video before the uh, title Dungeon Craft comes up. And this is what it looks like from all sides. And I'm going to make a house that looks pretty much like this one. One unique feature about Tudor style buildings is they have these overhanging floors. So you can see that second floor has a little bit of a bump out in the front. That's going to be the most difficult aspect of our geometry today. I made this building and all of my buildings out of foam core I buy from the dollar store and it's got this really poorly glued paper on the back. You can easily pull it off like so. Here are the dimensions for the side walls of the house. It is six and a half inches wide and six and a half inches high. It's a perfect square. That puts the midpoint at three and a quarter inches. That's where the peak of the roof is going to be. Each floor is two inches. So we're going to measure out four inches, and that's where the roof is going to begin. And we just draw a line between that and the peak. The overhang measures out to a half an inch. So again, each story is two inches, so you cut out a half inch by two inch section to form that overhang. Notice here I'm cutting with a metal ruler. I always say this in my videos but it bears repeating that you don't want to use a wooden ruler because if something slips the, the blade can go through the wooden ruler and into your hand. The overhang on the other side is going to be the mirror image of this one. The easiest wall to construct is the back. It's going to be 7 inches wide and 4 inches high. The front is actually going to be two pieces, each 7 inches wide and 2 inches high. That's because we're going to have that overhang in the front. The doors are going to be 1 inch wide by 1 and a half inches in height, and I use a template. I use this template, I think, in my How to Make a Door video. I rounded the top with a bottle cap or you could use a quarter and once I have that template, that cardboard template, I just find the middle and I trace out where the door would go. I draw out the planks with a gel roller pen. The first line is straight down the middle and try to make the boards equidistant from each other. I make four boards on a door. Here's how I make these stone blocks that are going to be on the arch of the door. I'm going to use my door template again and cut out the middle. 
I draw out a quarter inch wide arch around the door freehand with my pen and I cut that out as well with my X-Acto knife. I draw the keystone at the top of the arch then I go to where the bend begins and I put a mortar line there then I put other mortar lines in between the keystone and the bend then I put about four more lines all of them about the same size I take away some of the styrofoam at the corners with my X-Acto knife this will make the blocks look more defined and I glue it around the door using tacky glue Tacky glue is white glue but with less water so it's really sticky. It dries faster than white glue but it's malleable and allowing you to fiddle around with the piece make sure it's in the right place. I have a 1 inch by 1 inch wooden window template that I use for tracing out windows. Using a wooden template is going to make your window sizes consistent and that's the key to getting this done, all the windows done quickly. For the second floor I put the windows an inch and a quarter from the edge. Don't ask why, it's just going to come out right. Remember, an inch and a quarter. I don't measure the distance between the windows, I just measure how far they are from the edge and they will naturally come out equidistant. Same thing on the side, one and a quarter inches. I also use my ruler to draw a faint line across so that the windows are at the same level. For the attic window, just do your best to center it. When cutting windows, it's important to use a brand new X-Acto knife blade. Take your time. By moving slowly, you're going to get a cleaner cut. For the chimney, I use this pink styrofoam insulation. Just lay it on the template and measure a little bit more than that because it's going to go higher than the roof. The piece is going to be an inch and a half wide. And I cut the piece in half. If I had a wire cutter or a proxon cutter, this would be a lot easier, but I don't. So instead, I'm just going to use my box cutter, but just work very slowly and carefully. And that's how it measures up. Looking good. I have a smaller box cutter that I use for carving detail. One feature of chimneys is they're more narrow at the top than they are at the base. They're also not going to have straight edges. They're going to have rounded edges because they're supposed to be made of stone so you can use your knife to shave down those edges. The chimney will start to become narrower at the two inch mark. So that, that mark of pencil that you see, that's where the ground floor would end. And I just carve off the sides until the chimney is maybe an inch wide at the top. I carve out the stones with my gel roller and where it goes around the corner, remember to continue the stone because that's supposed to be one stone in there. And I just draw them out, little circles, connecting them, putting the mortar lines where I feel they should go. This takes some time, there's no way around it, so it's a good thing to do while you're watching TV or you have the news on or something. And again, glue it in place with tacky glue. You might want to weight it down for a, an hour or so. The windows are made of two materials. First, common kitchen wax paper. Then, I have this mesh that I got from the yarn section of my craft store. We're going to use this to make the diamond-shaped leaded pattern that those old medieval windows had. I got this idea from DM Scotty over at the DM's craft. He, I think, painted his. I just buy black. I paint the edges of the windows black. Don't ask why, it's just going to be really important for later. I cut a strip of wax paper, this is about an inch and a half, and I cut those into squares just slightly larger than the windows. And I white glue these into place. And now your windows have old timey frosted looking glass. Remember that window template? Well, now you're going to use it to cut out a window. Notice how I'm cutting on an angle diagonally from the corner. This will create that diamond shaped pattern that we want.
Use Elmer's clear glue to go around the edges of the window and then just drop the lattice work in and you have a leaded window. Because you use the template, every one of the windows is going to be exactly the same. The reason why we painted the window edges black is it'll cover up any imperfections. Continuing with my kitchen paper theme, we have a piece of tin foil. I roll it up in a ball and I'm going to stamp all of the surfaces of all of the pieces. This will give the surfaces a rough, sort of patchy, stony texture. I've seen crafters use plaster and wood filler and snow text to get texture on their pieces, like between the beams and stuff. I did that as well for years, as a matter of fact, until I figured out you could just stamp it and achieve the exact same effect with a lot less effort. Here's another way to save a lot of time. Drawing out individual stones is very time consuming and if I did it I wouldn't be able to do this in one day. One way to get around this is to create just a couple of blocks sticking out from the stone. I cut these bricks out of cereal box cardboard and I just white glued them in place. And you'll see when it's painted up it's going to look like a stone foundation but in a fraction of the time. I'm making a few last minute modifications to the chimney. I cut down the top so it's a little shorter because I don't want it being broken. And then I, again, rounded the edges, touched up my stonework, and used my soldering tool to create the chimney, just barely touching it to melt the styrofoam. Here I'm just finishing up the mortar lines on the top. Okay, so it's glue time. I've got my hot glue gun heated up, and what's important to remember here is that the front pieces go on top. Take a few moments to make sure the pieces are completely flush before the hot glue dries. You'll have a few seconds to manipulate them. This wall is slightly warped, but that's okay. You can always just bend it into position. I also stand it up to make sure that it's not slightly higher on one side. I also cut corner braces out of cardboard and I hot glued them to the lower corners. This will give those corners extra support where it's needed because that's where the wear and tear happens and the corners will eventually begin to separate. I cut out a strip for the overhang. It's a half an inch wide and it's six and a half inches long and I hold it in place for a second to make sure that the, when the glue dries, again, it's flush. Last comes the front piece to the second floor. And this is our building now all the way around. The roof pieces are four and a half inches by just over seven inches in length. That's because there's going to be a slight overhang and we want them to be flush and meet at the top. So in order to do that, we're going to have to bevel the edges. To do that, I use my ruler and I cut at a slight angle. And by doing it on both sides, we'll get a nice flush fit on the roof. For the overhang on the roof, we'll want to bevel that as well, creating a nice tight fit on the corners. Here's the 360 view and it really does look like a house. Here it is from all the different angles. Now for the part every building crafter dreads, the shingling of the roof. Shingles take a long time to make no matter which way you make them. Most crafters make shingles out of cardboard, cutting them individually or cutting them into strips but this is very tedious and time consuming and it creates an extra step where you have to paint them. But I've come up with a solution that I think is very innovative. I've never seen anyone else use this material. It is this piece of foam that is self-adhesive and it comes in the color black. It's 99 cents a sheet. It's manufactured by a company called Creatology. I used a similar type of foam to make a stone staircase in an earlier video, and I'm gonna use this material to make the roof tiles. Here I've gridded it out into half inch strips, and I thought it would be interesting to see if I could do this 
how fast I could do it. So I've set my timer, the clock is ticking, and I'm going to see how long it takes me to do this. I further grid it into half inch squares, and that's going to be the size of the shingle. I use a box cutter to cut it, and the first thing that I noticed is that it was really easy to do. There's almost no pressure being applied here, and it just sails right through without requiring a second cut. I didn't speed up this video so you could see exactly how long it's taking me. And you can see they just come right apart. And I just use a regular pair of scissors to cut them. And the other thing I noticed is this was really easy on my hands. Usually I, I you know, if you cut cardboard, it gets fatiguing after a while. But here, they're just flying right into the cup. Now comes the shingling. So. I was very impressed with the the stickiness of the glue, the adhesive that they used. I was expecting I would have to use more glue, but in fact I did not. It really sticks. When layering the next row of shingles, make sure you put the shingle over the crack. The, the cracks will never align. They will always alternate. If the shingles are a little crooked, don't worry about it. It's going to look even better. And now, using the magic of editing, my roof shingles itself. If you look at the sides, you're going to see some overhang, so just turn the building over and cut it with scissors so it's flush. So I was pressed for time and didn't have time to make the dormers, so I just shingled the other side. And now it's time to move on to the crown. I have these roof tiles that I didn't cut. They are half an inch by one inch long, and I just lay them across the top and I lay the next one on top of that one at about the midway point. And this creates a scalloping, kind of like a lobster shell. Every few shingles I stop just to press them down and make sure they're sticking. And again, I was surprised. I did not need extra glue. Everything stuck in place just perfectly. And there's the finished roof. And I have to be honest, this was the fastest, easiest, and I think the best looking roof I have ever made. And I was able to complete it in under 60 minutes. And now for the timbering. Many people use balsa wood, but I use cereal boxes. Each beam is going to be slightly over a quarter inch wide. The reason I use cereal boxes is because it's way cheaper than balsa. Balsa can be expensive. Like it might cost a $4 sheet to do a whole building. And also it's not as malleable. You need to cut balsa with a knife to avoid splitting the wood, but with cereal box cardboard, you can just cut it with a pair of scissors. The timbering should be done after the building is fully assembled. You might have noticed some clips where it looked like I had done partial timbering. That was a big mistake. I always forget what order to do the timbering. The reason that you want to do the timbering after it's assembled is because you want to use the timbering to cover the seams. This means that there's going to be timbering at every single edge. Then after you do that, you can put in beams in the middle. I use beams to frame the windows, so they double as both a beam and a window frame. It saves you a lot of time, and I've seen that on real buildings. the timbering complete, I move to the cornerstones. Those are the stones that frame the first floor. I've already drawn them with my pen, where the stones are going to be. I'm going to make them out of this material, green stuff. A lot of different companies make this product. I find the best is the tape. It's by far the easiest to work with. You just knead it, and when it turns dark green, the epoxy is activated, and it'll slowly start getting hard, even as you work with it. I fashion it into a brick as best I can using my X-Acto knife. If you don't have green stuff, carve these stones out of foam core and glue them down with tacky glue. I do the larger stones first. If you look at these types of buildings, they have this pattern where it's a large stone, smaller stone, and it alternates. So I do the big ones first. And then I put the smaller ones in. 
You can shape the green stuff with your fingers. If you find it's getting hard, just dip your fingers in water and it will become malleable again and you can erase any fingerprints you leave behind. To define the edges and the mortar lines, I use this metal tool as well. Now for the fun part, the painting. So I ran out of dark gray, so I used a little gray, added a little black, and I'm going to match it up. I used this dark gray to paint the ground floor and the chimney, anything that's stone. For the plaster between the beams, I paint that honey brown, which is not the color it's going to end up. It's only the base coat, and you'll see why later. For the timbering, I use Americana Raw Umber. It is the darkest brown I could get from that line. You want to use craft paint for all this stuff. You don't want to use your Citadel paint or Reaper paint because it's going to take a couple of coats of this. The cardboard will soak up a lot of paint, requiring at least another coat. See the wide variation there? So yeah, you want to hit it again. and I paint the door as raw umber as well. While the brown is waiting to dry, I move on to the dry brushing. I take a medium gray and I wipe it off on the paper towel with an old dry brush and I just lightly go over the surface. You can see here that the details really popping out and the key here is not to overdo it. Don't press too hard. Make sure you try to get all the paint off on the paper towel and go in both directions with your brush. I use that same gray on the shingles, going in again in both directions, mostly going up so I can get, we can define those shingles a little bit more, but going down as well, and you can see the details really going to pop out. The shingles already look good, now they're going to look great. No additional dry brushing is necessary, the roof is now done. The stone, however, is going to get one more highlight. I'm going to take the same brush, not even cleaning it, just moving to white and lightly dry brush it one last time. You might think it's too light, but we're going to give it a black wash later to give it a more unifying stone look. Now that the beams are dry, we can go back to them. I'm using a honey brown using a, a filbert brush, and I'm just painting down the middle with a very light touch. It's a harder touch than just dry brushing it, but I'm not pressing too hard or attempting to cover the surface. I'm just painting a highlight down the middle. And by painting like this, because cardboard is made of wood, a natural grain, cardboard has a natural grain and it will emerge and it will end up looking like realistic wood timber. The final step is to give it a dry brush of fawn and this very light gray brownish color is going to give the wood a very weathered appearance. You can see here I'm giving it a very light feathered touch and that will instantly give it a look of being weathered and aged. The doors are going to get the honey brown treatment as well, just painting a, a stripe right down the middle. But it's not going to get the fawn because these doors wouldn't be as exposed to the elements, right? Because they're under that stone, it would be protecting. 
The final step for the stone is giving it a wash, and I want to give all credit to Jeremy at Black Magic Craft for this wash recipe. A few drops of black paint, one drop of green paint, a bunch of dirty brush water. I'm going to fill up that, uh, that vitamin jar about half way, and I'm going to shake it up. So that's about 10 parts water to one part paint. I wipe some off on the paper towel to make sure it looks dark enough and I'm just going to paint the stone surface with it. And you're going to see it's going to flow right into the cracks and make those cracks more visible. And you can see that that wash makes it really look like stone. It really unifies the color and draws them all together. And now for the white washing. I'm going to be using this paint. It's an off-white called Vanilla from Craftsmart, very cheap. And I'm going to add a ton of water so this is really thin it's about the consistency of skim milk here and now I'm gonna paint between the timbers if I'm not mistaken this is actually the way Tudor buildings were made that material between the timbers is kind of like a, a clay and it's got a darker color and they would wash it white and now because we have a darker base coloring under it it's not going to dry a uniform white color it's going to have a kind of a patchy, grimy kind of look, which is what I'm going for. You can even leave a little of that honey brown showing through at the corners to make it look like it's dirtier and grimier. To create a door knocker, I use a drop of Elmer's clear glue and one of these jewelry clasps. You can get like a hundred of these for just a couple of dollars in Michaels or Hobby Lobby. I'm going to embellish the door with some banding and studs. The banding is made from miniature clock hands that I found in the jewelry making section of my craft store. And the studs are made from tiny paste jewels that can be found in the same section. I'm going to paint them shadowed steel for a base coat and I'll do the same to the studs, gluing them into place with Elmer's clear glue. I maneuver everything into place with the tool. It comes in especially handy with those studs which are really difficult to manipulate with your finger. And our door is complete, and I can do similar embellishments to the other side. And with that, our tavern is finished as well. Here it is from all the different angles, and feel free to embellish it even further by adding shutters or maybe a tavern sign. Put in some battery-operated tea lights, and it looks like a tavern. How cool is that? My total cost with the foam board and the foam for the roof and the lattice work, it was about four or five dollars. And now left you have a tavern of your very own. Please like, share, and comment below. Once again, this is Professor Dungeon Bastard for Dungeon Craft. I'll see you at the table. May all your future rolls be 20s.